You're about to join Jerry Parker, Maritz Siebert, and Niels Kostrup Larsen on their raw and honest journey into the world of systematic investing and learn about the most dependable and consistent yet often overlooked investment strategy. Welcome to the Systematic Investor Podcast Series. Welcome or welcome back to this week's edition of the Systematic Investor Series with Moritz Siebert and I, Niels Castro Larsen, where each week we take the pulse of the global markets through the lens of a rules-based investor. For those of you who are regular listeners, of course, our conversations are intended to keep you focused and inspired to continue your rules-based investing journey. And if you're new to the show, we hope that today's episode will trigger some curiosity to check out the back catalog and listen to past episodes you may have missed. Now, before we get started today, I do want to share some amazing news that took place this week, namely that Top Traders Unplugged was named the best trading podcast of 2020 by the team over at The Investor's Podcast. We are, of course, grateful for this recognition. Being recognized by your peers always means a lot. But of course, the podcast is a team effort. So I want to take this opportunity to Especially thank you, Moritz, for co-hosting the Systematic Investor Series, as well, of course, as Robert Carver and Jerry Parker. And also a big thank you to our producers and tech people, Dimitri and Shane, who work really hard to make us sound good and create a lot of the social content that we are able to share. And of course, a really big thank you to all of our amazing guests. And last, but certainly not least, all of our fantastic and loyal listeners who tune in every week. We really could not have done this without you. And for me, it's been a six and a half uh, year journey, crazy journey. And I hope that we can continue to create better value for you. But Moritz, that was great news this week. Fantastic news. Um, yeah. Very happy to hear it. And, you know, thank you once again, once more, also from my side to the the Investors Podcast team. Uh, we know Preston. We've had him on the show. So we're absolutely thrilled uh, to have this. Um, thank you very much. And well, here we are. Here we are again, another week. Going for another episode. <laughs> exactly. Another week have flown by. So uh, I hope all things are well with you. Now, in terms of a market wrap, uh, Moritz, so the last week of October certainly was a little bit different. We saw some sharp reversals in some of the trends that had occurred in the prior weeks, both in global equity markets, but also in terms of how the world deal with the COVID-19 virus. And of course, over here in Europe, we had kind of a slow spread over the summer, but then in this late, or I should say late autumn or late summer, early autumn, this has certainly changed. And during the last week of October that we just finished, pretty much unanimously, the largest countries in Europe and, and following along that, a lot of other countries are starting to do lockdowns again and announce far-reaching message, measures to combat this further spread, which of course has had a negative impact on the markets. Now, from the US perspective, the, the S&P was down about 5.5%, I think, last week. But what we forget sometimes is really that Europe is completely different. I was just looking at the numbers this morning and we have countries like Spain, which is down 32% this year, the UK down 26%, Germany where you are, Moritz, down 12% and Switzerland where I am is down nearly 10%. And on top of that, in terms of equity you know, pressure, we saw this week that again, the safe haven asset class of choice, at least historically, bonds are not really offsetting these losses that we see in equity markets. And of course, I think we all know why that is. I mean, rates are at zero. We've discussed this many times. But when you look at the fact that you have governments and corporations entering 2020 with record levels of debt and through this crisis have just added to that, and for some at least at dramatically higher rates as well, this could lead to some stress an insolvency, even for some of the nations, I think, uh, when we look into 2021. But before we get to 2021, Moritz, we have to get through one very important week next week. Yes, the election week. It's election like, week. Finally, have, we're finally, finally here. Everybody's so, uh, so excited about that date, uh, November 3rd. Um, well, let's see what happens. I've said it before. I think it is still pretty much a coin toss. Uh, I don't think that some of the odds that are reported 
which are north of 90% in favor of Biden. I, I, would, I wouldn't bet on those. But anyhow, let, let's just wait for that, for that day and, uh, and take it from there. I, I agree with what you said with the bonds. The bonds really didn't react to the down move in the equities, which we saw especially this past week. Right, We had consecutive down days on indices such as the DAX, quite severe. You've just mentioned down 12%, right? So it's a quite a different picture compared to, say, the NASDAQ or the S&P 500. And even though those markets went down and volatility is relatively high, bonds are staying where they are. Maybe they're going down even a bit, right? So yields are increasing. So the diversification and the protection that a lot of the 60-40 risk parity portfolio owners got used to in the years prior, and which has worked so well, is not working right now. So you need something else. And it wasn't gold either, because the dollar was so strong this past week, right? A strong dollar is bad for commodities, it's bad for gold. And so gold traded down. So that didn't help. And I was just really happy to have diversification in some of the other markets, like we trend followers have, you know, soybeans and corn and, you know, some of the metals. This is really valuable at a, at a time like that, because we're not dependent on just, you know, two or three picks in our portfolio. Now that said, it was a flat week for me. I, you know, I didn't lose money. I also didn't make any money, but I did see some volatility. And this is something that we had last week before as well. You know, we had a long, long stretch of really nothing moving. I said this on the podcast, right? It's kind of like, I'm just, you know, a couple of basis points up, a couple of basis points down, mostly down, but really no big moves, no big ranges. But this has changed. I mean, I'm, I'm still short oil and oil has traded down to, I don't know, 36, 35, somewhere around that level. I'm talking about WTI here. And so this was a very, very big winner in my portfolio this week. Short rapeseed, short, you know, some of the equity indices, uh, short the ruble, dollar being very strong, as I've said. And I made money by being long the bubble. The bubble was, the bubble is the five-year German treasury, so to say. And that one moved quite a bit more than the other ones. Don't ask me why. It just happened to be the case. I'm long, so that's good. Of course, I had some some losses as well, right? I mean, I'm long the emissions contract. That was really bad. I'm still long soybeans and a lot of the grains, right? So being long corn and long soybean meal, that didn't work this past week. But here you go, right? I, I had a flat week, made some money on Bitcoin, which is great. So of course overall, you, yeah. you know, if you add all that just together, it's it's been a positive week. But I'm not I'm not just betting on the bonds to bail me out here. No, 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 absolutely. Now, just before I, I go into sort of how uh, the month panned out for us, it is interesting, though, that I've seen a study some time ago relating to, you know, U.S. elections and how uh, how often actually presidents gets reelected based on just uh, equity market performance. Something like if, if the market is up something like 20 percent or whatever the number was, in the years leading up to to the election or the three prior years leading up to the election, then actually there's very high likelihood that the president gets reelected. And I think from memory, at least, that right now, just looking at purely mar um, equity market performance, Trump is very, actually not that far away from achieving the level where, according to history, at least, you know, he would be most likely reelected, which, of course, is not what what the media expects if you just listen to that. So I think either way, whatever comes out, I mean, we may not find out this week or next week who's the, who the winner is. I think that's probably more likely that that uh, that's uh, going to happen. And, and, and I think we could be in for some serious level of volatility going into the last uh, couple of months of, of the year. And, and actually, as you said, What's interesting about the last um, few weeks is that despite uh, equity markets making new highs or getting back to almost new highs uh, only a couple of weeks ago, the VIX has not traded down to the pre-COVID levels. It has been staying elevated and it almost hit 40, I think, this week, which is quite high from a historical perspective. Let's not forget that when Lehman Brothers went under, it went to 31. So we're above that level right now. So definitely some uncertainty out there uh, in the numbers. 
Yes, and COVID, right? I mean, you have the yeah. election coming up. That's reason enough for implied volatility being high the way it looks right now with, uh, you know, Biden versus Trump. And like you say, maybe there is a contested election. We don't even know who the president's going to be on November yeah. 3rd, 4th, 5th, 6th, right? And maybe it, it, it takes a time for that to become clear. But then COVID is a, a whole different thing. You know, here in Germany, we're going into another lockdown as of next week, Monday. So 48 hours to go not even, and then the country will be partially locked down again. It's a different type of lockdown than the one that we did in March, April, May. It's more granular in, you know, the way it is uh, defined and, you know, what people are allowed to do and for what reasons they're allowed to leave the house. But regardless of that, right, a lockdown is a lockdown. It is, it is bad, no matter how you slice or dice it. And it is devastating for businesses, you know, restaurants, gyms, swimming pools, you know, bars, you name it. I mean, all that, all that is, uh, is hurting and suffering. Somebody needs to pay for that, need to, needs to really bail that industry out. Artists are obviously complaining, right? Because you cannot go and listen to concerts or, you know, go and see a theater or opera or anything like that. So it, it, the, the ramifications of that, they are very broad and very large and very bad. And nobody knows how that is going to end right now. I mean, our daily rate of infections here is uh, is uh, 20,000 per day. And this sounds very high, but it's actually very low when you compare that to, say, the countries of Italy, Spain, France, and, you know, some of the Switzerland neighbor is Switzerland, maybe 9,000, and we're like a tenth of the population. Now. Tenth of the population. <laughs> so we have that. So there's a broader wave of infections, there's an increasing admittance to hospitals, and there's an increasing rate of death. And all of that is, you know, kind of like delayed by three weeks, because what we're seeing today is probably what has happened three weeks ago, in terms of, you know, becoming infected and uh, becoming ill and becoming sick and then being admitted to hospital. It is bad. And this means that, you know, maybe November and December could be really, really horrible month. And, and January and February and March maybe also, right? Because we don't have a vaccine and we don't have a cure, we don't have medication, and we somehow need to wrestle through that period with the virus around us. Absolutely. I mean, and certainly companies have had to be very creative to come up with ways of, of just getting a little bit of cash flow. I heard from a, a, a very reliable source uh, out in Singapore that Singapore Airlines has started offering that you can buy a ticket and you come to the airport, you check in, you go to the your plane, you have your seat, you can buy different classes, of course. And then you sit on the ground in the plane, you get dinner served like you would normally on a flight, you watch a few movies, and then you get, get out again. And it sounds completely crazy, but, <laughs> but nevertheless, that's what they do to uh, get a little bit of cash through the, the system. And these tickets are, are apparently, they're going like, gold i mean they're just being it's very difficult to get hold of them yeah i mean crazy stuff yes i uh i've i've read similar stories and i also know about that story from singapore apparently there are really some people addicted to flying yeah they're on the business circuit you know whizzing around the world and now they're going i don't know a couple of months without being in an airplane and that you know creates that itch which they right. cannot reach it's kind of like an itch far down the back and it's like you know yeah. i have to get I have to get into a plane. So there, there are stories about people hiring or chartering planes just to, you know, fly around Singapore or Hong Kong or chartering a helicopter with their friends, you know, for no, not to go from A to B, right? You know, just to go, you know, off the ground and fly around a bit and come back. Yeah. You know, I, I used to fly quite a bit, I'd say, but um, I, I don't have any withdrawal symptoms. Not, not yet. I, I'm no, quite okay the without the airport. It's probably one of the few uh, upsides to uh, to COVID as well, that not having to go away every week somewhere. But speaking about the markets, from our point of view, October was pretty flat at the end of the month. So um, earlier gains were, were given back in the last week. That's how it is. Not from the equity markets. Might, people might think, well, you know, markets, uh, equity markets turned down. We didn't actually lose money there um, because we have quite mixed positions in that sector now. So mainly long US, short Europe. Instead, on our side, losses really came from commodities like cattle, grains, and the metals 
And also the currency sector where the stronger dollar didn't help our short positions, really. But, you know, for the month as a whole, it was really down to um, to the fixed income markets. That's where we saw the losses for the month, and particularly the U.S. fixed income markets. I actually think we made a little bit of money in, in European or non-U.S. It's, and, uh, and those losses were then offset by gains, as you said, energies were pretty good. Grains for the month were pretty good, actually. Uh, and then I think currencies overall for the month were a non-US, non, oh, actually, maybe not. I'm looking at the charts here. No, maybe not. So anyways, oh, sorry, I mean non-US fixed income. They actually worked out pretty well. Like you said, the bubble did okay. And for our volatility strategy, we actually finished down the month a little bit, still up strong for the year. But of course, these slightly unusual things that we see in the in the VIX right now, the elevated levels, yeah, just didn't pan out as well as as uh, as we had hoped for this month. But um, as I said, it'll probably be more interesting to follow the next couple of months in the volatility space than the the last few months or, or weeks. So yeah, that's how it all panned out. Much we got quite a few questions. Uh, some of them, of course, from the last week when we had Michael Covell uh, on the show. And again, mm-hmm. thanks so much, you guys, for sending questions in for the episode with Michael. That was great. And so now we're going to try and uh, go back and and deal with some of the questions that we couldn't get to last week. So the first one is from Matt, and Matt actually referenced back to a question we got a couple of weeks ago from Doctor Doom. I think Dr. Doom had, as he calls himself, a question about whether actuaries would have a good skill set for becoming sort of systematic traders. And Matt actually is himself an actuary, and he runs uh, systematic trading strategies on his personal account. And then he writes, the actuary skill set and stats can definitely help one thing that I think helps a lot is the natural focus on actuaries on risk management, which encourages you to set sensible position size so you don't lose your shirt. But I would also say that being an actuary is probably only only gets you 20% of the way being an effective trader, if that. There's a lot still to learn and a lot of work to do. You need to invest a lot of a lot more time in understanding the markets and market behavior better than and an actuary training covers. You also need to invest a lot of time in finding and backtesting setups that work. I think it really helps to pick up some data science coding skills, which actuary courses and training doesn't cover to enable you to be efficient in backtesting setups. So first of all, Matt, thanks for that comment because it's always helpful when when you, the audience, pitch in in terms of some of your own real life experiences But then you do have a question that we will tackle uh, now. So the question is, how to take external money stepwise into your systematic trading strategy or if you should avoid it? And I think actually maybe, Moritz, you might have some interesting comments on that this week given what you, uh, what the the person you told, you you interviewed recently that we're going to have on the podcast next week. Then now you know what I'm referring to. (laughs) You probably have no clue what I'm talking about. But anyway... Let's say we have a good systematic strategy in place and are developing as much of our own uh, and are deploying as much of our our own capital to this as we feel comfortable with. We're generating good, reliable alpha and have some headroom to run a larger pot if we had the money. We are a one, two year track record. We have a one, two year track record so far. Friends and family are interested in investing with a good track record. This could be be of potential value to other investors too, I guess. At the far end of the spectrum, you could set up a hedge fund. This seems to be a huge endeavor both to set up and to market it to investors. The question is, are there other practical options that sit between the two extremes of managing only your own money versus set up a hedge fund that enable you to stepwise increase the size of the pot you're managing? I think that's a great question, Moritz. I'd love to hear what your thoughts are. I would say that very, very strongly depends on where you're based and the regulatory environment that you're in. Um, And I don't know the regulatory environments of all the countries around the world, of course, right? I can tell you that, for instance, in my home country, which is Germany, 
just taking on money from external people is not permitted. You need to be licensed, you need to be regulated if you want to run external money, even though if this is just $1 or $100 or $100,000, it doesn't matter, right? Because if you're managing other people's money, you're running their portfolio, you have authority to, you know, put trades into their portfolios, trade for them, give them advice, whatever the case may be, you need to be licensed. And there's different levels of, you know, regulatory approvals here. I mean, some of them are, I don't want to say light, because this is really yesterday's news. It used to be that there, there were some lighter levels of regulations available. But ever since the global financial crisis, this has changed. So even the, if you know, say, say I wanted to run somebody's money, run a managed account for somebody or set up a fund. I've mentioned that last week with Michael Covell. That means that I need to start a firm, get you know operations in place, get people in place, risk management in place, technology in place, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. All of which is very expensive. So therefore, it becomes a very important business decision for you whether you want to go down that route or not because you have to pay these people. And we're living in an environment where fees are compressed and maybe even further compressing. So an asset, asset raising isn't easy either, right? Especially if you're coming up with a CTA trend following fund. I mean, there's simpler things to sell, I would say. Think about it from that perspective, you know, from a business perspective. Is that something that you can do? Is it something that you can fight through and come out at the other end with, you know, a large enough AUM and large enough and big enough stability around your business so that that remains fun to do? So that's that. But there may be countries where you don't need these regulatory approvals or you don't need as many regulatory approvals. I really don't know where you could be your one man show or maybe a two man show and get somebody to, you know, uh, have, have a managed account with you and, and, and you'd be fine to do it. I, I cannot comment on that. I'm not a lawyer. Now, that said, as Niels was referring to the unknown name that we're going to have on our podcast show next week, that is Jack Schwager. And I had the uh, honor of speaking to him two days ago, actually. I interviewed him for his latest book, The Unknown Market Wizards. And most of the people in there, if not all, I haven't read all the chapters, right? But one common uh, theme that's shown through all the time is they are essentially one person businesses. They are prop traders. They run their own money, like Tom Basso, right? Some of you may know Tom Basso. He's a trend following trader. He runs his own money. He used to run a business called Trendstead, but now he's you know retired from that and he's running his own money. And obviously, if you're running your own money, then you don't need any regulation. You just do whatever it is that you want to do. And this can be very liberating. I think that can be a lot of fun. There's also potential for massive success in that if you do it right, if you have the right attitudes and the right skills as a trader. And I therefore recommend to read Jack's book because this is what it's really all about, right? I mean, the people that are successful, it's not because they've tossed the coin eight times in a row and it came up heads and they were betting on heads, right? They have defined an edge. They have discovered an edge. They've put in the work, hard work, hours and hours and hours, right? They've you know defined a methodology that works for them. They're sticking to that methodology. They're managing risks. They're cutting losers. You've heard that before, right? It's 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 the recipe for successful trading, but it's so difficult to follow that recipe. But I think if you figure that out for yourself and you have a bit of capital, then being a proprietary trader, being responsible for your own money and your own account and seeing that grow is actually quite enjoyable. And you don't need any business around that whatsoever. I will now finish my, my long answer here. Always put the... The additional revenue that you may get from adding a little bit of money to the trading systems that you run, put that in relation to the costs that you will incur and the inconveniences that you will occur because you have to run a business and make reports and speak to regulators and do this, that, and the other thing, right? And then sum it up and decide whether that is what you want to do. What, what we know is that the firms that when they start up that become successful financially, economically, they now get massive amounts of seed. And they have head traders or fa their founders have worked at hedge funds before where they're well known in the industry, right, for their trading skills. 
And they go out and they command, I don't know, 500 million. Some of these guys start up with north of a billion, north of 2 billion in seed capital, right? And obviously, in these type of stratospheres, it's a complete different business decision, right? It's still a business decision. Of course, you have more money, you have the potential for much more fee revenue, but I guess, you know, uh, they will also run larger operations with more people, etc. But it really has, our industry has changed in that way where years back, you, you, you could start a CTA with probably 10, 20 million, something like that, maybe 30 million, right? And you get that amount of seed capital, you would be making two and 20 on that. You'd had maybe three, four, five people, but you know, it, it would be fine. If you're making the returns on that money, then that is a business and you can pay everybody. This is, this is over. This no longer works, right? I mean, the seed capital amounts have changed from that level to at least a hundred because you need a hundred in order to pay the six, seven, eight people that you need in your business from a regulatory point of view. And they all command relatively attractive salaries, right? Because they're not, I mean, they're, they're, they're good guys, they're clever people, right? They're doing a great job, so they want to be paid. They want an equity stake in the firm if they're coming in early. And and there you have it, right? So even at 100 million, it, you're not making two and 20, you know, maybe you're not making one and 10. Maybe your CETA requires you to, you know, have a very preferential fee treatment and um, and, and and then a stake in all future revenue. Anyway, I'll, I'll stop here. What I want to say is I love that business. I, I have my heart in that and I'm not going to do anything else, right? It's for, for me, this is this is a passion, but I'm in a larger group where we do it in an institutional way. I'm I'm not I'm not running my own fund that I need to pay out of my own pocket, so to say, right? But if people are interested in that, I just say think about it. Yeah, no, I think it's a very wise piece of advice to Matt and um I don't have much to add to that because I really do think things have changed as, as Moritz rightly put it. I think the optimal setup nowadays would be to, you know, have a job that you love. It doesn't have to be trading, but, but have a job that you love doing and do that. But then on the side, as your hobby, do what Moritz and I have done, develop systems that you can actually do in your spare time that you can run very easily you, because they're systematic and you can put in some of your own money and you can basically grow your account. And people might say, yeah, but, you know, it takes time. And, and yes, it does um, because initially when you start with the, your initial capital, you know, com compounding that with whatever return you get doesn't stand out initially. Compound The compound effect comes over the long run. That's where you really see it. But it's there. And I mean, I can see that if I, if I look at Don's track record, you can go and find it. Michael Covell publishes it on his, uh, on his uh, website. You can see what compound returns really mean. And so I think what Moritz is saying that all the burdens you have today by starting a firm is probably, I'm not sure it's really worth it anymore, frankly, and if you do, it's certainly going to be, you know, a lot of hard work, without a doubt. And I think the other thing that Moritz said is that's really important, that even if you do get it off the ground, and this is something I think both Moritz and I know quite a lot about, raising assets is incredibly hard nowadays in this industry, and it's becoming harder every single year. And also, as Moritz says, you have then on top of that fee compression. So I think that that is really something you want to think about before you're doing it. Now, there is maybe one middle ground. I've not tried it. I don't know any one person who's done it. But I have seen that a number of brokers offer something called copy trade. And I think one bank in particular that I can think of, which is Saxo Bank in, well, I say Denmark, it originates in Denmark. I think at one point they started a program or a feature where you could agree with them where they would kind of be the taking care of the regulatory burden because they would be the counterpart and where you, if you had a really good strategy and you could pr demonstrate to them that it made money if they put it on their copy platform other people could actually invest money quote unquote with you and you would get some kind of fee for it i don't know i don't know the details you have to look that up so there are some of that where it's kind of an in-between. 
but you may have to disclose all your trades and 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 rules. I don't know to 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 uh, to the bank you work with, but maybe that is the only thing I can think of, Matt, that lies between doing it yourself for friends and I don't I don't even know if friends and families are allowed to invest as more said with regulation as it is, but. The, the 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 old way or your own way of doing it uh, and then the complete opposite which is to start your own fund have you had any experience with this these kind of copy trade or uh, facilities Moritz? no I, i i'm not using them and i can explain why i know they exist i mean here in germany there's one that's called wikifolio and i don't want to speak badly about them on the air like at all i mean they do their business and i guess you know some people like that business and As you say, Niels, they partner with banks and then they make that um they make the portfolio of private traders available to a larger audience. You know, they kind of like, you know, you trade into an account and they wrap that account into a certificate, right? So, or or note structure, and then they on sell that. It does have an ICE in, etc., right? They don't on sell that to clients. There are other examples out there. I'm not sure. If, uh, if I have the rate that the name right, Quantopian, or there's some, you know, US based firms where, you know, you can go onto their platform, write Python code of strategies that you think that work, right? And if they do work, then you may get capital. Well, Jack Schwager's business, fundseater.com. Now, this is different. Let me let me make that distinction. I think it's an important difference. So let, let's just stay with firms such as Ficofolio and, and this U.S. firm. Let's say it's Quantopian. I, I'm not sure if that is right, but something along that line, I think, is the name of that business. I I never want to upload any code onto any cloud platform, onto any network that is not mine, right? And, you know, I have my intellectual property sit there in an environment that I cannot control. And then if it is successful, if I really have a valuable strategy up there, Well, A, I'm not guaranteed that anybody's going to invest. And B, you know, if they are going to invest, I have no guarantee that, you know, that money will stay with me, but the code will be on that platform. So the the protections around that to me, they just wouldn't be what, what I would be willing to accept. I'm, you know, I'm I'm no longer at that point where I'm that desperate to to do that. So I'm no, that's a no-go. I, I I wouldn't do that. For some people, it may be the right thing. So that's what I'm saying. I'm, I'm not, I don't want to diss them in any way and say this is this is all bad. I mean, maybe for some people, this is exactly the, the right thing to do, but it just isn't the right thing for me. Fundseeder, to make that distinction, Fundseeder is a platform that links to brokerage accounts, right? So for instance, to interactive brokers. So you can connect your interactive brokers account to fundseeder.com. And what happens is that fundseeder.com will record your live track record because it is from interactive brokers, right? You're not sending them simulated or hypothetical numbers. You're sending them your actual trading results. And they're displaying that. They're running analytics on that, right? They have um, some risk-adjusted return scores, drawdown, et cetera, et cetera, correlation measures, you name it, right? It's all there. And there's there's hundreds of accounts on that platform. And and if you are say in in the in the top 10% of that of that group then odds are that somebody will get interested in you right they will see you and they will go hey well um i'd really like to learn more about that trader learn more about that track record and they have another business then which is regulated in the us where they can facilitate access to these traders so this is i think a good idea i'm i'm not sure what the fees are and you know how that is compensated but If you have a good track record uploaded to that platform, you don't have to tell them your secret sauce. Nobody asks you to, you know, give away your code. The only thing that you're doing is you connect your brokerage account. That's it, right? Your, your broker, interactive brokers, doesn't know your code. So you keep it all close to your chest, but you um, you give it an audience, right? And you build a live track record, which is so important. And if your account is really good, then I guess at some point, yes, people will find you and people will get interested. Yep. Absolutely. That was perfect. Brian, our friend Brian, who writes in from time to time. Nice to hear from you, Brian. Brian has another question, and that is he was watching an interview with Raul Powell and Keith McCulloch from Hedgeye and Real Vision, respectively. Raul talks briefly, so um, Brian writes, Raul talks briefly about positions trapped in commodity limit down market, unable to execute stop loss. He mentions a recent example in Lumber Futures. Please discuss how experienced CTAs trade these limit down situations if it's not 
a secret sauce. So um, let me tackle that for you, Brian, because it's relatively easy. If a market is limit down, it's lim- or limit up for that matter, you can't trade it. And that's just the way the world works. It doesn't mean that it has to be limit down all day or limit up all day, meaning there will maybe potentially be some trading going on if it moves away from that limit down price. And if people don't know what limit down means, it's just a predefined percentage move for the day where the market just stops trading. We saw that even in the S&P and other U.S. equity futures during the March 2020 sell-off. So it does happen. It happens more in commodities for sure, and especially in the smaller commodities, it can certainly happen. But there's here's the point. There is no secret source to avoid it, except this is exactly why you want to be diversified and you want to trade small, because it will happen to your portfolio. And it should not be something that devastates your returns just because you have one market that goes limit up or limit down and you can't get out of your position. And and I will even add to this, Brian, and that is these things can happen on sequential days. If there's a really, really massive move, you can actually end up having two or three days where the market goes limit up or limit down. And so you need to account for that in a sense through risk management, through diversification. What about you, Moritz? Not much to add. If it happens, it happens. Yes, you know, right. if you're limit down, you're limit up. Hopefully you're on the right side of that limit event. Then it's, it's not as uncomfortable then. But it is sure. part of the reality and it's part of trading. So sure. you need to, like you say, Niels, you need to factor that in when you test your strategies, right? Mm-hmm. And and don't just, you know, take the historical data. And I, I think, you know, when you look at the historical data for some of these commodity markets, analyze how frequently they go limit in either direction. You know, how often does that happen per year, per five years, how many days, how many consecutive days, right? Because by just looking at the chart, if you're looking at the chart of, I don't know, lean hogs or live cattle or whatever, right? Um, you don't really eyeball these events anymore, right? It's because if you're looking at daily data, it's you, you, you don't see it, right? But you, you can be trapped. And therefore, I really recommend to, you know, look back onto these time series and get a feeling for, in percentage terms, how many limit days there are in the sample that you're looking at. Do you know how to identify those, though? I mean, yeah, how easy, because I when, when I think about it, I mean, yeah, I can look at historical data, but it wouldn't strike me whether that was a limit down or limit up day, uh, really, if I look at the historical. Is there any, I mean, it's actually a pretty good thing if you if there was some kind of data source that would flag mm-hmm. a limit up or limit down day. There are vendors that flag that, right? Okay, so the, cool. the price or the end of day has an, an indicator or a letter that okay. indicates whether that was limit down or limit up. If you don't have that, and by the way, I have done that myself personally, it's uh, it's a lot of work. Uh, yeah. You can look up the exchange rules, right? And yeah. because it's out there, it, it tells you uh, what the moves are uh, up or down for a limit event to occur, right? And then you look at the historical data, you have your open, you have your high, you have your low, you have your close. And then, you know, you can just figure out you know, through these numbers, whether you had a limit day. Just jumping ship completely now, before we go to the next question, just something that I was reminded of when you talked about exchanges and all of that. Two things uh, I wanted to ask you about. One is, why... Why do you think palladium seems to be completely different in terms of initial margin? I'm, I'm thinking it's because it's volatile and it's not very liquid. I don't know. But I mean, it just, when I looked at that, that recently on the exchange, it had like a huge number, like $30,000 per contract or something like that, initial margin. So that's one thing I wanted to ask you about, whether you had any insights to that. And the other thing I saw on a, on a tweet, maybe it was yesterday or something like that, that someone posted that one of the bigger brokers, and I use brokers in a loose way because I can't, I don't think it's necessarily a, kind of a futures broker, but it could be like a CFD, I think it was, where they were announcing a massive change to their margin rules, which essentially meant that 
right now you could get uh, like leverage of like 100 or 200 times in some of these markets and then starting in 2021 maybe q1 2021 or something like that in a few months that is going to come down dramatically to like 20 times leverage which is still in my opinion is more than enough right uh, I, I can't even understand that they offer 200 times leverage at the moment but but th- usually when th- this is just for for people who may not be aware of this but usually when margin rules change and this is one of the weapons that exchanges use to kind of control volatility and extreme moves etc cetera, etc cetera, it can have an impact so i'm just thinking if generally and I don't know how big the CFD market is, but I know a lot of retail investors use CFDs and not futures. So if that is something that's happening, and I don't know whether you heard about this coming in the next few months, then that could have an effect. And by the way, another thing that I just thought about that I wanted to ask you about is, I noticed in a Twitter feed this morning before we got on air, that apparently there's another whale out there right now. There's apparently someone in the last few days that have been buying up massive amount of call spreads on equities, so expecting some kind of massive up move after the U.S. election. So maybe you, maybe you have some thoughts on any of these things. A um, couple of thoughts while you were talking, Niels. I calculated the percentage initial margin requirement of Palladium, which is fourteen percent. The initial margin requirement is 31,000 US dollars and the current contract value I'm talking about the front month here is $221,000. So if we divide 14, uh, sorry, if we divide 31 by 221, that's about 14%. 14% is a bit higher indeed, as you probably suggest, than the initial margin requirement of some of the other markets, right? Historically, we had equities and the range of five to eight percent something like that right short-term interest rates and bonds substantially lower fx a bit lower than equities and some of the commodities you know are higher such as you know crude oil net gas has a relatively high initial margin requirement etc so usually or let's say generally it tends to be a function of that market's volatility i don't off of the top of my head, I don't know the historical margin requirement for Palladium, but I can look it up. I'm actually intrigued now to see whether that was 8 9 or 10%. Remember, we had a very volatile margin, a very volatile mm. April in Palladium. You know, Palladium moved up, 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 up every day. It was one of my best markets in the portfolio, and then it crashed down, and then it moved back up again. It did the V, right? And exchanges oftentimes, exchanges slash clearing houses oftentimes react to these events and they increase margin requirements for speculators and hedgers alike in response to that fall. And maybe they've just kept it there. Mm. I don't know. But the important thing for, for listeners to take away from that is that initial margins are not static. Initial margins change. They change over time and they change idiosyncratically at a point in time when the exchange or the clearinghouse decides that they want them to change. So that impacts your account. It impacts your account in a couple of different ways. It impacts that from a margin to equity perspective. It impacts it from a funding perspective. You may get squeezed out of your positions, right? If you're not holding enough capital against it, right? And it increases costs because you're paying a funding spread on the margin, okay? So it is worthwhile. I mean, you don't have to have a hawk eye on that every day. I don't, right? But I do every month. Every month, and this is kind of like this weekend, you know, once on a weekend, it's kind of like either the last weekend of the month or the the weekend thereafter. On a monthly basis, I go through all of my accounts. I check currency exposures, you know, I check margin requirements. I look at the margin requirement per market, whether that has changed. It's just housekeeping. And it's, you know, it, it, it gives me an opportunity to, you know, reconnect with the system, see what's been going on, take a closer look at things, has anything gone wrong? Did I, you know, overlook something? Is everything in order? Et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. These type of things. Has margin to equity changed? What's my open trade equity? You, you know, you know the drill, right? Yeah. So I'm doing that. Absolutely. I'm doing that once per month. And I find it, I find it a, a good thing to do, at least for me, cleaning up. So what what also happened is 
there's one broker and I'm happy to name it. It's interactive brokers. I'm not trading a lot through interactive brokers and, and I can explain offline as to why that is, but Interactive has sent me a message and I guess uh, people who trade through Interactive have received a similar or the same message a couple of weeks ago already where they're saying in light of the upcoming US elections and anticipated higher volatility around the event, they are increasing their initial margin requirements across the board and they already have substantially higher margin requirements than the exchange requirements, right? But I don't know what the number was, 20% or 30% or something like that. I have another broker who I think is doing it in a very professional and really straight way. Uh, RJO, uh, really like those guys. Uh, you know, they charge the exchange or the clearinghouse margin requirement. And they're saying, well, okay, there is this election coming up, fair point, right? In order to protect the firm and in order to protect clients, don't forget that, right? I mean, it's not only about protecting the firm, it's also, you know, about protecting all the people that clear through that firm. Right, so it, it it is not something that is necessarily against your interest, right? Uh, if 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 they, you know, become more stable, but they don't do it across the board. They don't say, "Hey, look, you know, everything goes up by twenty percent or by thirty percent as of next Monday," right? They say, "Look, there's a couple of contracts which are probably, you know, where where people have positions in, lots of positions in, and which are, you know, presumably very directly affected by an uncertain election outcome." the S&P 500, right, euro, US dollar. And then, you know, they have like a list of five or six markets where they go, it's for those markets, right, where, you know, we're putting things up by a reasonable percentage amount. It wasn't 30% or anything like that, right? But if you're trading soybean meal, well, what the heck? That just stays exactly where it is, right? And I guess that's fair. I mean, I I like that approach. Yeah, no, absolutely good, good stuff. Okay, so we move on to uh, next question. This question is specifically for you, Moritz. It is from, and I'm going to butcher your name and I apologize in advance, but it is from Panagiotis. The question is, it's about portfolio construction. Even though you have probably covered this topic in a previous episode, I would like to ask the following. One, could you explain which portfolio construction method do you guys use and what is your approach to it? And two, I recently came across a brochure of five from Munich Re, which describes a hierarchical risk parity method and how it can lead to robust portfolios. And I find it quite similar to, but more mathematically rigorous than a handcrafting method proposed by Rob in his book. Would that be correct? Now, of course, Rob is coming on the show in a couple of weeks, I think three weeks maybe. So we might bring this up with him again. and But then this uh, risk parity, and then the final question is, since the risk parity strategy from ME heavily re- from Munich Re heavily relies on machine learning, do you see any other use cases for ML in trend-following systems in general? Thanks in advance, and keep up the great job. Now, before you answer all of this, Moritz, because it's mainly for you, I just want to say one thing about the machine learning in trend-following from conversations I've had with some other managers who do use machine learning, they actually, I think what they said is one of the challenges with using machine learning in trend following is the fact that we have very few trades per year. So if you do it on a longer term trend following system, does machine learning really make sense at all? But I think if you were talking about short term, high frequency types models, then it could probably be more relevant. That's just my two pennies. I'm going to give it over to you, more to talk about the... Well, I may come back and talk about the portfolio construction, but certainly the whole risk parity stuff from Unigree, I'm going to let you talk about. Yeah, happy to do it. And uh, by the way, thank you for reading our material. I think um, in the past two or three weeks, we've uh, put a little bit of a LinkedIn campaign out there where people got uh, aware of Five. Five is a, is a brand, Five like the number Five is a brand that we're using and it is it is the brand of our systematic index business or just our index business right so the munich Re markets group produces quantitative investment strategies for for clients life insurance companies right who have an interest in these strategies because they want to develop savings and retirements products for their customers and they're using our strategies to do that most of these strategies i would say have a because you know the, the 
the policies or the products that are sold to end clients at the end of the day they're like you know life insurance type of product so it's kind of like 20 30 40 year very long dated exposures or investments and you know i think it's very difficult to have a 30 40 year year a view on fx carry or you know commodity congestion or mean reversion or any of that right i mean that's not what people are interested in for their very long term savings allocation so the indices that the five group produces um they're more like you know bonds and equities and it have they have a momentum filter and they have a risk parity weighting and you know these type of things so that you can have a mixed asset allocation for the long run now to more specifically answer your question right there's many different ways to you know think about the allocation and the position sizing of your portfolio the way I do it with my trend following portfolio personally, I've said this before, is not risk parity, right? It's a form of vol parity or average true range parity in essence, right? At the time of position inception, but without any ongoing volatility control. That is the allocation method that I use. I try to give every trade the same amount of, let's use the word risk or the same amount of vol or the same ATR to normalize my losses and have same expectations across all of these trades. And then I leave it alone. Not everybody does it that way. Some people go, okay, I'm doing a form of volatility parity at position inception. Say you're looking at a bond equity portfolio, but then there's a risk parity. And now we really have to define and distinguish the two terms dynamic that happens after that which takes into account correlations you know i'd say in, to, to simplify the difference between volatility parity and volatility only looking at volatility and risk parity is that risk parity also looks at the correlation dynamics that happen inside the portfolio and a risk parity algorithm would therefore recognize that you're putting up uh, heating oil and crude oil at the same time and scale them back down that is something that in our trend following portfolio, I also do, but I do it in a more ex ante defined way by saying, well, if I have heating oil and crude oil at the same time, right, then I don't give them deliberately the same risk, but I actively make that decision. I have no algorithm that makes that decision for me. And then to distinguish that further, there is the HRP approach and then many, many other approaches that become a million times more complex. but. HRP hierarchical risk parity essentially is a risk parity approach, but tries to filter only for the most dominant and the most relevant correlation dynamics that happen in the portfolio. It tries to remove all the things that don't really matter and that don't count, if you see what I mean. If there is a, a correlation, you know, that's between 0.3 and 0.5, and then it's 0.1 again, you know, it's, it's like, yeah, that, that is not maybe the, the driving force for the positioning dynamic of the portfolio. It's more the things that are like stable at minus 0.8 and positive 0.8, right? And, and you're just like with a, with a minimal, minimum spanning tree, you're, you're trying to identify where those things are. Then to the extent that machine learning, that term was used in that paper, well, I mean, it's very light machine learning, right? But you can use some of these call, call them more advanced analytical methods to figure out what those correlation dependencies are and where they are significant and where they are not. Yes, we can put that into the ML box. There's there's code that learns more about these dynamics and then, you know, creates inferences and and you know comes to a conclusion as to, you know, what assets to really include in the correlation mark, uh, matrix and, and and which ones not or the covariance matrix. So that is that. Now what we have also found and I think this is, for me at least, the most important takeaway. First of all, doing the research is great, right? And, and, and looking at things and exploring new things. But when we all break it down, we, we step back from the results and we look at it and, you know, over, over the, the long term. And we're now looking at, well, what, what is the best approach? What performs the best? Which one should we take? What we have found is that Honestly, it doesn't really matter that much. It really doesn't. At the end of the day, they're producing kind of like the same returns. And that is also true for my simple-minded 
equal ATR, equal vol, equal risk, whatever type of approach at position inception, and then thereafter, no touch, right? And with my simple-minded, oh, if I have crude oil and heating oil and gasoline at the same time, then I don't give them the same risk, but I have that written down already today. And, you know, it's kind of like in the rule book. That performs just as fine and sometimes better than the complex risk parity and the super complex HRP, Heraclitus parity approach. And then I always come down to, well, simple is better. Why, why do I want to run... Um, an ML algorithm on my machine that I can no longer understand. A, it takes, you know, quite a long time to, you know, write that stuff and, you know, figure out how it's supposed to work and not make mistakes, right? But then when the thing is live, just, I mean, it overwhelms me. So I don't do it. But of course, you know, we, we do the research and I think that is our job, right? We're in that business of designing quantitative investment strategies and, and those type of systems. And I think we wouldn't be doing a good job if we just, you know, laid back lazily saying, oh, well, here's something that we've designed five years ago. Uh, we think it's the best. We'll never look at anything else. Uh, just, just take that one. We have to keep our eyes on the ball and, you know, constantly and continuously research these things. And, and you know, every once in a while you discover something that is absolutely fantastic. I'm not saying that Heraclitus parity is, is bad in any, in any way. It's just as good as any of the other things, at least in my opinion. My colleagues may differ uh, from my opinion, by the way, right? They, uh, they have released that paper. I'm not one of the authors, right? And then it's like, yeah, well, this probably is, is really is really great. And, you know, we would like to really do this because it produces, I don't know, eight basis points better return per year. And it's like, yeah, of course, go for it. I don't care that much, but <laughs> this is this. Yeah, and, 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 and there are definitely different ways to skin a cat so i'm gonna dig into uh, a little bit of my past to uh to uh, answer this question because before my time at don i had my own cta and uh, we developed back in the period around 2007 our trend following system and to this day i run that system every single day so i know exactly how it's done and even though uh, it hasn't, the model hasn't changed since about 2012. There are small tweaks in the first few years, but since then, nothing has changed in it. And it's really interesting. And it's very similar to what Moritz uh, does, meaning we size the position, or I size the position at the time of of signal, and and, and it's not touched, you know, before uh, before it, it the, it's exited, and and then you get a new situation and a new entry signal, and then you size the position again and it's it's very robust i mean it's up 26 plus percent this year and it's a fully diversified 44 market portfolio or so it's actually the same markets that i use in the trend barometer that i publish every day on the website and the i think it's called the daily market trends is the other one i publish it's not the same positions you can see on that website but i may one day make this transparent to people uh, one way or the other, how how that operates. But of course, my my day job at Don, we do things differently, and um, our portfolio construction is similar to in 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 some sense, meaning we want to treat all markets equal, but we have different ways of managing the risk. Um, we look at it more on a portfolio level on a daily basis. We have certain risk limits we need to adhere to, and based on those overall risk limits. Then we look at what are the strengths of each signal that we have in the portfolio for each market, and then allocations are done accordingly. So a different way of doing it. And I will say that certainly that way of doing things and that system has been more consistent recent years, meaning it's handled better this, let's call it a little bit of a famine in trend-following returns in the last few years. I would say definitely it's done better. But in the very long run, it's not to say that it is better, so to speak. So this is just how trend following can be done in different ways, both from a approach point of view, what constitutes an entry and an exit and all of that, but also how you construct your portfolio and how you manage your risk. I think for most people, if you want to do this yourself, I think the approach that Marge used on his system, the what I do on a personal level, and what Jerry does, which is really the entry and then no touch until you exit, no 
put, put, uh, position adjustments along the way, probably the much easier way to, to do it. Doesn't mean that there is any right or wrong way of doing things. I want to move on. Uh, we're just passing the one hour mark, so we're going to start to wrap up soon. But there are some more questions. We may not get to all of them, but I want to get to Craig's question for sure. Okay, he says, I wanted to get your thoughts on something. I've been running a profitable short-term breakout commodity strategy for over three years now. It has an average trade duration of four days, a low win rate, 35 less than 35%, and he uses a profit target, the profit target being roughly four times the stop loss. It's led me to question whether the adage, cut your losses short and let your profits run, is a universal axiom. Perhaps place right-tailed asymmetric bets is more important regardless of whether a profit target is used or not. Any thoughts? Yeah, I mean, well, what, what, what he is doing is he's cutting his losses short. I mean, the way I understand it, the stop loss is He's cut his closer. winners short. Cut his winners short. Yeah, but right. less yeah. short than the losers, right? So the way I understood it is that the profit target is farther away from the entry point exactly. than yes, the stop. Exactly, yes, for sure. Right? Yeah, yeah. So you, yeah, yeah. you do have an asymmetry there. You yeah. can make four times as much gains yeah. versus the losses, right? So, so that that in essence is the asymmetry that is creating that right tail, that positive skew in the distribution of the returns. Now, you're not really, I mean, the, we're cutting our losers short, maybe in the same way that you're doing it, but we're not giving up on the winners. We're much more patient with the winners. We really let them run, and we don't give them a profit target. We give them an exit. The exit may be at a profit, the exit may be at flat, or the exit may be at a loss even, right? So we give them a lot more time. And this is because I think, you know, we're, we're, we're more medium to longer term in our trading approach. He has just mentioned that he runs a short-term trading system with an average holding time of four days. This is not what I'm doing. I don't know. Maybe if you deliberately run it on on such a relatively short time frame, then then you need those profit targets. I I can't comment, but I mean the the fact. That, let's just stop here. That the fact that he has a profit target that is farther away than the stop loss is something I would say. Well, that's that's a good start, right? That is moving it in the right direction. There are many systems, by the way, that are the opposite. A lot of the mean reversion systems that work, right, have very tight profit targets. And they have a stop loss that has much more room, right? So you're looking for a bounce back, say, in a stock market, buy the dip type of thing, right? You're immediately taking profits. You're taking small profits, small profits, 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 profits. It works many times, 70, 80, 90% of the time. But you're paying for that with relatively large losers, right? And sometimes those losers become super large. And this is, I think, a recipe for disaster because you know they lead to paralysis they can really kill your account and i don't know of any successful trader who has who exists who is uh, successful because he's taking super large losses i mean that's just uh doesn't work again i think you're i think you're absolutely right more it's that when you talk about short-term systems it, things are different one thing you may want to look at craig is maybe you need to not use the same type of profit target for all markets. Maybe you do need to look at the return distribution of each market to see if there are some markets that just have a tendency to some bigger outlier gains, and then they may need that profit target to be moved up a little bit compared to other markets that may not really get to that level that often. I don't know. But our philosophy is that you never know how great the trend is going to be. So we're going to let it run for as long as we possibly can. But uh, short term is a little bit different. I know a lot of managers who do use profit targets. You could also use time stops. A lot of managers use that. You know, say you have two, three, four holding uh, different models with different time holding periods. That might work. It's worth testing for sure. With that, I think I'm going to leave the questions from James and Anti for next week. Or maybe not for next week, actually, because we have jack on but we will get to your question but i do want to start to wrap up so it doesn't become a too long episode but do send us more of your questions they're really good and i think they're very educational for everyone listening to that so before we get to some of our cool content at the end of the show which is um, something new that we started doing 
I will just mention that although it's not the end of the month for these numbers, it is at the end of Thursday, which wasn't the last trading day. I think yesterday was a bad day for trend followers in general. And so just be aware of that. So it looks like October at the end of Thursday, at least for the B top 50 index was down about 25 basis point down 1.66% for the year. The SOC and CTA index was down 0.14%, down three and a quarter for the year. The trend index was still up for the month, uh, up 1.07 for October, down 1% for the year. The short-term traders index was down 31 bips, but up 1.89 for the year. As I said, these numbers will change because Friday was probably a bad day, I imagine. The SOCGEN multi-asset risk premium index, though, was down almost 2% in October and down almost 15% for the year. And then you have the, in terms of equities, MSCI World was down 3.14%. That is for the full month of October, and it's down 2.78 for the year so far. And the World Government Bond Index, as Martin and I already talked about, that was also down in October. So there was no benefit, no diversification benefit coming from that bond market in October. But then we started this new thing where we're going to talk to each other about what we listen to ourselves as a good recommendation for you guys during the past week. And um, interestingly enough, Moritz and I, before we pressed record, we were both sort of scratching our heads because none of us had really listened to a lot of stuff this week. It's been busy. But I think we did came up, we did come up with some something. Um, and uh, so, Moritz, what was your uh, what was your pick this week for uh, in terms of content? And two things I remember, Niels. One is a podcast uh, on Masters of Business with Ray Dalio. That is one that you had already mentioned, I think, one or two weeks ago. It's pretty I was good, just yeah. A bit, uh, yeah. Interesting. A bit delayed in listening to that one. Oh, there's another one. I listened to the podcast, The Memo. Oh, yes. Howard Marks. New, new, where yeah. everybody has a podcast now. Exactly, a new podcast. And I thought, well, let's let's do this because he, how it has a, a memory release probably two weeks ago, which um, I don't know, had 12 pages or something like that. So it's, it's, it's a bit of a read, right? And then, and I just listened to that and then didn't read it. And I thought it was a, that was a good use of, uh, of, of my time in the car. So I recommend that one. I actually thought it was very good. And then the the one that I also remember and that I recommend is a conversation with Annie Duke, Capital Allocators, which is run by Ted Cetus or Ted Sidus. I'm not sure how exactly to pronounce Sidus. Yeah. Sidus. Yeah. yeah. And Annie Duke is a former professional poker player. She has written a book or more than one book now, I think. The one book that that I have and which I think is great is called Thinking in Bets. And that is something that we systematic traders do all the time. They do it in poker. Uh, we do it in trading. You know, we place a bet in the market. The bet goes into its stop loss. Well, that's it. We're not we're not really too fussed about it or too mad about it. We'll do the next 1,000 bets. And over time, things should work out, hopefully. And, and Annie Duke, you know, comes at this from a poker perspective, but also brings that into different parts of our lives where these, you know, decision making concepts are very important. So I recommend that one. Yeah, no, I like any Duke as well. And funnily enough, my my piece of content, unfortunately, I think it's a paid piece of content. It's also from Ted Sidis podcast, but it's because I was on a Zoom call with him and Morgan Housel, the author of The Psychology of Money and many other books and articles really someone I enjoy reading. So uh, it was great to be on this call that Ted did this week, only a couple of days ago. As I said, I do think, unfortunately, it's a paid interview, so you may not be able to get it unless you already subscribe to his stuff. Um, but it was just very interesting to hear kind of Morgan on on uh, on a more casual way of uh, dealing with some of these issues that I think we all deal with and we all face when it comes to uh, investing and dealing with money and the whole psychology that comes with it. And, um, you know, I think we're going into a week where there's going to be a lot of emotion in the markets, maybe more than a week with the election coming up. And it reminded me of something that actually another uh, author who wrote another great book, uh, the behavioral investor, Daniel Crosby, 
that I have on the podcast. You can find the conversation with him in the archives and I really recommend you go listening to it. But one thing that stood out from that conversation, which I think I tweeted yesterday, is just a small snippet from the interview. And that is where he talks about that you shouldn't have any goals. You should only have rules. And and I think that's just such an important lesson to uh, to take away, if anything. And I think it's going to be proven. And that is probably my constant optimistic view on how trend following is going to do in the future. Um, but I do think that this thing about being rule-based in a world where potentially volatility might increase dramatically as we move forward is going to be something that is going to save a lot of people from a lot of money and will make the people who are involved in rules-based investing significant amount of money, whether it's trend following or other rules-based in trend uh, investing. So on that note, I think we're going to wrap up. Keep, as I said, sending the questions to top info at toptradersandplug.com. If you don't mind, uh, we're trying this experiment of getting uh, a few more eyeballs on the YouTube version. So please go to the YouTube channel, like some of the episodes, subscribe. That would be great. Of course, the ratings and reviews you've been sending or giving in iTunes are just fantastic, and we're so appreciative of that. So if you don't mind, spend a few minutes doing that. And Moritz and I will be back next week with Jack Swager. So do send us your questions for Jack. Um, that's going to be a fantastic conversation. Check out Moritz's conversation when it comes out on Real Vision later this week. And um, make sure you come back next week. Thanks so much for listening. And we look forward to being back with you next week. In the meantime, be well. Thanks for listening to the Systematic Investor Podcast Series. If you enjoy this series, go on over to iTunes and leave an honest rating and review. And be sure to listen to all the other episodes from Top Traders Unplugged. If you have questions about systematic investing, send us an email with the word question in the subject line to info at toptradersunplugged.com and we'll try to get it on the show. And remember, all the discussion that we have about investment performance is about the past, and past performance does not guarantee or even infer anything about future performance. Also understand that there's a significant risk of financial loss with all investment strategies, and you need to request and understand the specific risks from the investment manager about their products before you make investment decisions. Thanks for spending some of your valuable time with us, and we'll see you on the next episode of The Systematic Investor.